Okay, our last lecture is going to look at the role of surrogates in making uh, decisions. Um, ideally, as we've talked about in informed consent, we're looking to ensure that the patient is um, having the autonomy and the information um, to make the best medical decisions. But we can see that for a variety of reasons, sometimes patients aren't able to make um, these decisions for their own. So in the case of children, adolescents, um, incompetent patients, we can talk about the role of the surrogate, who is both authorized by law um, as well as ethically uh, informed to make decisions uh, on the patient's behalf. There are some legally recognized relationships um, of legal surrogates in medical decision making, which include parents for minor children, spouses for one another, uh, adult children for parents uh, when uh, parents are, are, uh, are lacking or parents are incapacitated, and even grandparents for grandchildren. Um, it is important to look state by state because sometimes uh, the first uh, in line in terms of a surrogate decision maker um, is slightly different. Um, but we'll take a look at um, some of the dimensions here. The whole, the, one of the legal um, overriding concerns in surrogates is to make sure that any health care that is provided um, is warranted. Um, and so this gets into this legal concern over unwanted touch or the charge of battery. Um, in an informed consent, you want to make sure that um, the diagnostic and therapeutic procedures uh, are uh, clear and informed. Hospitals should develop educational programs that are teaching effective ways of obtaining ethical and legal um, consent. And finally, making sure patients are aware of their rights to consent or reject proposed procedures and treatments. So we're going to see there are exceptions to informed consent and emergency procedures, but for the most part, whether to the patient directly or in the case of a surrogate, this information is clearly known before any care is given. So here's our exceptions to emergencies. Three conditions um, need to be met um, to justify treating without informed consent. One, the patient must be inca incapable of giving consent and no law lawful surrogate is able to give the consent. There is a danger to the life or danger of a serious impairment of health, and immediate treatment is necessary to avert these dangers. So you can think about these in kind of an emergency room situation where a person is brought in unconscious, um, particular uh, procedure like a trach needs to be done, um, and there is no law lawful uh, surrogate that's, that's able to give that um, consent in the period of time in which you need to perform uh, the procedure. There are exceptions in non-emergencies where um, we can talk about um, others who can step in. This is where uh, competency is uh, either non-existent or even doubtful. Um, and when there's no advanced directive, such as a living will, um, then legal systems can um, place a, a guardian ad litem. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, um, but oftentimes these can be consulted um, in making decisions. And we're also going to talk about the role of institutional ethical committees that um, now just about every hospital has, um, and we'll talk more about that, that makeup and how decisions are made that way. So a guardian ad litem is a court-appointed court um, person who represents the patients, particularly in non-emergency cases, um, and they are to represent the patient's um, wishes as best that they are known. Um, a guardian ad litem can be um, proposed or court-appointed um, when a lawful surrogate cannot be found, again, in non-emergency situations, or if the surrogate seems to be re choosing or refusing treatment that is not in accordance with the patient's wishes. So again, if the patient's wishes were known, either um, in an advanced directive or um, even the patient kind of telling a healthcare provider what they would want, and then the surrogate seems to be saying something the opposite, then if time permits, um, a guardian ad litem can, can step in um, to, to have a role to play in mediating that. Institutional ethical committees are made up of uh, multidisciplinary groups 
which can include healthcare providers, lawyers, ethicists, sometimes religious leaders, um, a variety of folks with different perspectives. And they, they perform a number of uh, functions. One is um, certainly to educate um, the public about biomedical uh, ethics. Um, they can also help uh, policy, uh, hospital um, policy development. And in the connection with informed consent, they can act as a consultant in difficult cases. So hospital um, professionals can call upon uh, an ethics committee to form and um, give a recommendation. We're going to look through some of the um, concerns or at least questions that have been raised um, in your book. Um, but this makeup of the ethics committee is important to look at. And I just noted that it particularly talked about the lack of nurses. Um, again, this is not across the board, but in some ethics committees, um, they don't include enough um, nurses. And, and oftentimes, um, nurses are the ones who have the most um, connections between family members and the patient and all the different, um, what we would call the moral agents or stakeholders um, in making a decision. Some of the other questions that the Hastings Center um, provides, some guidelines, is asking the question, when an ethics committee um, is formed and they review a case, is their recommendations optional? Is it merely advisory? Um, must the patient or surrogate consent to a, a committee review? I think these are all questions that need to be um, raised at the, at the beginning, so there's an understanding of what's um, being reviewed. Does the committee consider only ethical problems? Um, oftentimes, obviously, um, members of the committee are not uh, on standby, so when a committee is formed, what constitutes a quorum? How many available participants are really needed in order to, um, to reach a consensus? Um, do recommendations require consensus? Does there need to be uniform agreement? And will a written record be kept in the patient's records? So for the most part, I think your book is saying that ethics committees are helpful guidelines, but the clear way in which they are formed and how we understand recommendations and the makeup um, of the ethics committee is important. Um, ethics committees really began um, when there was some emerging technologies um, like dialysis machines um, and there was limited resources and sometimes they were kind of nicknamed the God Squad, um, you know, in terms of making decisions about who lives and dies. But it should be noted that really ethics committees bring a multidisciplinary um, approach and can really be helpful in, in trying to bring um, stakeholders and viewpoints together in making a decision. We don't want to end um, this unit without talking also about um, informed consent and the right to refuse treatment. So um, the right to refuse treatment um, is very important and is based only on the competence of the patient. Okay, it's not whether the medical um, uh, practitioners feel like it's the right or wrong decision. It needs to be honored. We can see that this become problems area, particularly in nursing homes, where many of the patients in these homes are threatened by dementia or other factors. Um, and healthcare profession professionals, professionals in these cases should take um, the following steps. Um, admission. Before the admission, the surrogate must be made aware of possible uh, future decisions, and they should be asked for written directives. And the importance of a living will, will or advanced directives are really important um, in uh, informed consent, because then you really have a record of those patients' wishes. Um, we're just going to apply this um, briefly to the uh, provisions um, in the Nursing uh, Code of Ethics. Um, and there were two in particular that, that jumped out to me. There might be more for you. But the section 1.5 talked about the relationship with colleagues and others. And this idea of maintaining professional, respectful, and caring relationships um, seemed really important in informed decision making, that you, you as the nurse are kind of bringing a lot of this conversation together. And 2.3 also talks about collaboration, where nurses ensure that all the relevant persons as moral agents participate in patient care decisions. So I think this, this idea of the, the patient as um, uh, the nurse as the patient advocate is still uh, important, but um, we're also going to see that um, there's a lot of different individuals and factors that 